Amen. You may be seated. Deuteronomy chapter 2 tonight. We're going to jump on in. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Deuteronomy chapter 2. And we are studying the book of Deuteronomy, our theme for this book, as we see uh, instructed all throughout, is for the people of Israel to remember and obey. And so we're looking to the scriptures to see what it is that they were told to remember and the uh, importance of these things. If you'll remember last week, we looked at several uh, portions of uh, this, this latter part. We're going to be in verse, uh, we're going to jump to verse 20, 24 to start off with. We'll start at verse 24. And then we'll pray and we'll jump back in. We'll go back uh, to verse 16 after we pray. Uh, so as you get to Deuteronomy chapter 2. But if you'll remember, uh, we ended with studying a little bit about the chastening hand of God. And we understood how the Lord uh, chastened the people of Israel. Uh, and specifically, these men of war uh, because of their complaints and their ultimately their lack of faith in God to take care of them. Now we're going to be in verse 24 to start. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 24. Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, in his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven. Who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening and we just want to say thank you so much that we can have that blessed assurance. Lord, we are grateful that we can gather together in your meeting house and that we can study your word and we can learn from it and that every, every portion of this book we can apply to our lives to learn something about you, even if that ultimately is that you should receive honor and glory and that our life needs to be more focused on you. Lord, I pray that you would help us now as we study together. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand uh, uh, prophetically the fear of the nations. I pray that you would help us to understand the warning of the children of Israel or to the children of Israel not to meddle with certain nations. And Lord, I pray that you would ultimately help us to see that you are in control and that uh, we are uh, protected that as your people. Uh, there's nothing and no one that we should fear. And Lord, we see that you are also the deliverer. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help all of those things just to rest upon our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to preach our opinion, but to be faithful to preach your book. Give us the words to say in Christ's name. Amen and amen. The chastening of the Lord has been accomplished. Now go back to verse 16. We jumped ahead a little bit to get to a particular part for the majority of our lesson tonight. Let's go back to verse 16 uh, to kind of remind us where some context is. The chastening of God has been accomplished. Look at verse 16. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people that the Lord began to spake unto me, saying. So we now have the time frame. So everything in Deuteronomy, Moses is telling the children of Israel by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's teaching them so that they, prior to going into the land of promise, will remember and obey that God is their God and that God is in control. We see tonight, as we're looking at the history of Israel, we're seeing Moses pointing out God's deliverance. And so if we were to have a title, the history of Israel, God's deliverance uh, that we see uh, found here in this particular passage as we'll get to that when we get to verse 24. But before we get there, there are some things of note that we need to uh, pay attention to. Look, if you will, at Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 18. Chapter 2 and verse 18. Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, uh, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, 
And the Ammonites call them Zamzumims, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before the Lord, and they seceded them and dwelt in their stead, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horems from before them, and they seceded them and dwelt in their stead, even unto this day. Verse 23, And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Aza, the Kaphtarims, which came forth out of Kaphtar, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. If you're taking notes this evening, point number one, I want us to see the instruction to meddle not. To meddle not. Point number one, to meddle not. I want us to understand that Israel was given specific instructions when it came to certain lands and certain people that was not promised to them. Here in verse 19, he told them that when they go over, when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. If you remember back several weeks ago in verse 9, when he, they came to the Moabites, to their land, he told them neither contend with them in battle. And then we see a discourse over which that the scripture shows us something about these lands. These lands were filled prior to Lot's family and pri uh, prior to Lot's family overtaking these lands. The Bible teaches us that these were accounted as lands of giants and even possibly during Lot's uh, offspring's time in those lands. And so the Lord instructed the people not to meddle with the Ammonites, just like the Moabites, not to contend with them. And these are both the seed of Lot. So their land was already given as a possession. Now we see the unique similarities here being this note of giants in the land. Not most of, if not all, of the civilizations that God wiped out using the children of Israel had giants in their land. Why would this be? What is something that we need to know about giants? Now, some of you know where I might go with this, but we ain't going to go there tonight. Amen? But I do want to look at Genesis chapter 6 to find out something. The first time that we see giants show up in Scripture. And I want us to see what the result of those giants being in the land would be. So Genesis chapter 6 tonight. Now if you're interested in knowing where the giants come from and why they're not in existence today... You can ask me after church. All right, we can talk about that. Uh, but we've dealt with that before, and we can deal with it again at another setting. But for tonight, I want us to notice some specifics about the areas where giants inhabited and the reasoning why. Oftentimes, people, they read the Bible, and they see the children of Israel were told to go into uh, the land and to wipe them out, as we'll see here in just a minute with Sihon the king. Now, I'm not saying, let's just, just to clear up, I'm not saying that they were told not to meddle or contend with those people because of the giants. We know that's not true. They were getting ready to go in the land of Canaan. is filled with giants. They were told not to meddle or contend with the Moabites or the Ammonites because that land was still given to Lot as their possession until much later in Israel's history when it would no longer be Lot's possession. And that's what would happen if you study out the history of Israel, and you study out the Ammonites. And the Ammonites and the Moabites essentially were, would become people that invited the ch chastening hand of God and the wrath of God because of how they dealt with the people of Israel. Remember the promise of Abraham all the way back in the book of Genesis? I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curseth thee. Well, Moab and Ammon throughout their history would curse Israel by constantly attacking them and by constantly back their enemies and so eventually Ammon and Moab would no longer be the possession of Lot they lost out on that birthright but I want us to notice here these two lands and the reason why God would put in scripture for us to understand that these lands had giants in them Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, 
which were of old men of renown. Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the first time, now some of you know Genesis chapter 6 very well. Some of you are going, wait a minute, this sounds familiar. This is just on the cusp of God destroying the entire earth with a flood. The entire earth being destroyed with a flood. Now here's what people say. It's because they were really bad. I'm pretty sure the earth is really bad now. Amen? It's more so than that. There was something else that was happening, and we see that it's directly tied in Genesis chapter 6 with these giants. The result of this extreme wickedness is tied directly to these giants. Every time we see giants in the land, uh, if you remember the story of David and Goliath, what is Goliath doing? He is mocking the God of Israel. He's mocking the God of Israel. So the giants in the land, most if not all of the civilizations that God completely wiped out in Israel's journeys had some tie to giants in the land. Why was that such a big deal? Because with those giants was a picture that we see great wickedness and idolatry to the point where they were cursing the God of Israel. And that's what you see all throughout every time you see giants. The actions of wickedness described in verse 5 as the heart thoughts only ever evil continually. In every land that we see scripture, we see giants, we find extreme wickedness. And there comes a point where God wipes them out. Now as we'll see in Deuteronomy chapter 2, when you get to the end of the chapter, we may get there this evening. We've got a little, a little bit of an early start, which is awesome. Uh, then you see in verse 33, they delivered, uh, the, they came out to fight against them. Verse 34, we took all the cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. Now here's what people who don't know the Bible, here's what people who read the Bible as, as a fantasy book or who don't trust the God of the Bible, they'll go, see, they destroyed even the helpless women and children. If God destroyed the entire civilization, there was nothing innocent or helpless about them amen amen and that's hard to understand but again back to Romans well we'll get there in just a minute we'll go to Romans chapter 9 God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy at what point do we as the creation get to question the creator right that's important to remember especially as you go through these God had Israel wipe out the entire civilization of this land, uh, uh, the king of Heshbon's land. Now, the reason why these giants are pointed out in the Moabites and the Ammonites is simply because it identifies them with the profound wickedness and the anti-God sentiment that came with them. And we see that all throughout Scripture being tied to the giants. And we look briefly just at Genesis chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, where you have giants appearing, and then all of the hearts of man are only evil continually. They're introduced to something, a great wickedness that infected the land. Everyone except one man and his family, Noah. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. He told them not to meddle with those lands. He did not tell them not to meddle with those lands because of the giants, because God was afraid that maybe the people of Israel in this new generation would not trust the report to go into the land again. No, he tells us clearly that this has been given. Look at verse 19, the latter part of the verse. This I have given because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. It's the same thing we see in verse 9, the land of the Moabites. I have given are unto the children of Lot for a possession. Even though the children of Israel were the, are the apple of God's eye, they are the chosen people, God is still faithful to keep his promises even to those who aren't Israel. Praise God. God is faithful. And so God told them not to meddle with those people because the, that was still their land. God would not destroy all of the earth. Uh, well, let's move on. Number two. We see this phrase in verse 25, the fear of the nations. This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee 
upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. We see what drives the fear of the nations from this text. A people who is chosen by God. And by the way, what has happened at this point to all of the men of war? They've been consumed. They're gone. Oh, well, they trained their children. The Bible doesn't specify that. The Bible clearly specifies that when the men of war were consumed, they were wasted out from among the host. Now you have a bunch of people in the wilderness who had not seen war yet. And they're going to go against a mighty nation here with the king of Heshbon and the people of Heshbon coming out to, get, to fight against them. And God tells the people of Israel, this day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, latter part gives us how, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. You want to know why the nations that got the report trembled? Because here are these nomads that come out of the wilderness, that have been in the wilderness for 38 plus years, and now all of a sudden they are a force that can destroy an entire civilization, and they've never seen war a day in their lives. They've never fought. Only God could do that. You know what that does? There's some, uh, whoa, wait a second. There's something about those people. We see the fear of the nations. We see a prophetic passage teaching us of the great fear of the nation when the people of the Lord are at peace. Look at Jeremiah chapter 33, if you will, please. Let's turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 33. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jeremiah. Amen. That'll help you there. If you want to find that real quick. Jeremiah chapter 33. Some of you Bible students, you think of Jeremiah 33. You think of verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know, I, that's why I can't, you know, I have a hard time with the name it and claim it verses. That verse isn't even about us. Amen. It's not a promise to us about anything. It's a promise to the people of Israel about something specific in a time of war. Now, does that mean we can't cry out to God? No, but there are other verses that specifically deal with us that are more, uh, uh, have, 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 a, have a heavier impact on the mind of a person who is learning than to take something out of context because what happens when you take something out of context and somebody goes and they study that passage and they realize wait a minute that's not the proper context they lose trust in the one who told them to use that verse and to hold on to that that's what happens proper context is important we don't get to just take verses and go all right this is to me because i believe it no 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 does that mean we can't call upon god no but we need to make sure we understand how this is properly applied in its context, all right? So, let's jump to verse 7, and I want us to see the promise, the prophetic promise of the kingdoms of Israel coming back to the land. Verse 7, and I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. Verse 9. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. So uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, go back to verse 1. That will give us a little bit of context. I want us to see this. We have a promise of God to bless the people of Israel by bringing them back to the land to build them again a nation. Moreover, verse, 30, verse 1, chapter 33. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, 
and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword, they are come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with dead, the dead bodies of men, whom I have slain in mine anger and in my fury, and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city. Verse 6, Behold, I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them, and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. What is he going to cure them of? He tells you in verse 7, or verse 8, iniquity. He's going to cleanse them of their iniquity. So here we have in Jeremiah chapter 33, a promise to the people of Israel, and a promise through the prophet Jeremiah, that God is going to bring them out of captivity, bring them back to the place, cleanse them from their iniquity, bring the cure for their land, and will heal them, and will allow them to see and to partake of the abundance of peace and truth. What great news for the people of God. What great news for the people of Israel. Now, verse 9, the latter part of the verse. Notice what it says. The nations of the earth which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. You would think good news would cause you to rejoice, right? Notice what it says. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I will procure it. It's interesting that when the God of Israel is blessing them with peace and with truth and with goodness, the Bible says the nations of the earth that hear it, they fear and they tremble. You ever wonder why Israel is such a hated nation? You ever wonder why? Because when they're in prosperity and the prosperous hand of God is upon them, all of the other nations, God used Israel. We're Old Testament. This is New Testament. Amen. Does that mean Israel's doing right right now? No. Are they still God's people? Yes. They're apple of his eye. Blindness in part has happened unto them. But they're, they're going to see one day. But in the Old Testament, what would happen? The history books were filled with the knowledge of the understanding that when the people of Israel were in their land and prospered, they were to be the light unto the Gentiles. And when they prospered, wickedness was dealt with through Israel. God used Israel to judge. And that's why when you see Israel prospering in the Old Testament, it causes the nations of the earth to fear and to tremble. And back in our text in Deuteronomy, he tells us that this day, Deuteronomy 2.25, when they go against Sihon, king of Heshbon, this day I, will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations. It all started right then. Could have started 38 years prior. Could have started 38 years prior, but they didn't have faith in God. When the Lord is on our side, what do we have to fear? Psalmist David even said in Psalm 27, let's look at Psalm 27. We, we're, we're doing well. Let's look at Psalm 27. I only have seven more points tonight. We're doing great. Amen. Psalm 27. Don't get nervous. Don't leave. Amen. Don't leave. All right. Psalm 27. Look at verse 1. Nobody tried to leave. I was looking down. I just want to see if anybody would jump up. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Bible teaches us about David. I like to go to David a lot. There are many people who have favorite characters in the Bible. and we, I hate saying the word character because it makes them sound like stories. These are not stories to help put you to sleep at night. This is a historical account of how God has worked through the world to bring His glory to pass. That's what the Old Testament is. Everything points, not to the cross, to His glory. Amen? Everything in this book. The theme of the book is not the cross. Amen? You with me on that? You understand what I'm talking about. The theme of the book is not the cross. Our rejoicing is the cross of Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection. But the theme of this book is not the cross of Jesus. The theme of this book is the Lord glorified. His kingdom glory. That's the theme of this book. Everything is about His glory. The cross is a part of that. 
because of his death and resurrection, we can then glorify and honor him and praise him properly. We couldn't before. The theme of this book is not the cross. Now, it's the greatest thing for us, but it's not the theme of all eternity. The theme of all eternity is him high and lifted up. Amen. When we get to Psalm 27 and we look to David, oh, that's where I was going. Some of us have historical figures in the Old Testament that we love to read about. Uh, uh, my, my wife's favorite, uh, uh, old, my wife's favorite Old Testament figure is Joseph. I think I think there was some. I was talking to somebody tonight, and they said they loved Jonah, and uh, they enjoyed they enjoyed reading about Jonah and just seeing how God, even when you fail, will will still use you. Right? Mine's David. It's up in the air between David and Abraham, for two reasons. For here, here's my here's my. Here's what happens. Abraham is called the friend of God. I want God to consider me a friend. But David, David was called a man after God's own heart. And to me, that's the driving purpose. And when you study the book of Psalms and you start to see the heart of David bleeding out throughout the scripture, and you find where he's at and you start to compare that to the passages to find where he's at and then you start to see his heart in the midst of that Psalm 27 the Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid at the conclusion of verse 14 the Bible says wait on the Lord be of good cheer and he shall strengthen thy heart wait I say on the Lord so if there's application to be had from Jeremiah it's to recognize that the Lord is someone we can call on but we don't get to hold those promises in Jeremiah as ours. He's not going to cure our land because we call him. Those cures were for Israel. Amen? But we can still call on him. But David, David points out that when we understand our salvation, our rescue comes from God, whom shall I fear? There's not much that keeps me up at night. Now, there are things that cause me anxiety that keep me up at night. But what I mean by that is it's usually because I suffer from uh, uh, open mouth insert foot disease. Amen. You know what I mean by that? I'm always afraid I've offended somebody. But I don't fear things like I did when I was a kid. Why? Because the older I get, the more I study, the closer I want to be to God, the more I realize whatever happens, he's in control. And I trust him. Now, the fear of the nations. Number three. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 27. Let me pass through thy land. Oh, let's go verse 26. And I sent messengers out of the wilderness to Kadmoth unto king, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, with words of what? Peace. Moses sent the people there not to provoke the king. But with words of peace, ought to give us some instruction, at least some wise counsel to understand. Even if God has called us to wipe someone out, what does he still go with? Words of peace. Did Moses know they were going to take out that, that people? Yeah, because God said, I have given into thine hand Sihon the Amorite. And what did Moses do? He sent people. He sent people to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, with words of peace. And what do they say? Let me, verse 27, let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn unto the right hand nor to the left. Thou shalt sell me meat for money and that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet as the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and the Moabites, which dwell in Ar, did unto me. Until I shall pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord our God giveth us. King, if you'll give, let us just have passage. Let us buy what we need for provision. We'll make our way. Verse 30, Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. It's from this passage that we're shown once again that God placed the king's hand, or the, king's, uh, the king in that position of power and controlled the king to the point to teach the children of Israel and for the purpose of delivering him and his people into the hand of Israel. A little bit of review since we have time. Romans chapter 9. Give you a place here. Let's go back to Romans chapter 9. It's a little bit of review from Sunday morning several weeks ago. 
If you'll remember Romans chapter 9, verse 17. We see the illustration that is used of the historical account. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Showing us that God used the sinner Pharaoh to display his great power. He did the same thing with Sihon, the king of Heshbon, in order to allow the people of Israel to obtain that area. That's what verse 30 told us in Deuteronomy chapter 2. The hardness of the heart of Pharaoh we studied was tied directly to his lack of faith in the words of God. Now, he, 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 he worshipped many gods. Moses only had one. Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may come out unto a place that I have appointed, so that they may worship me, and offer unto me sacrifices. And what does Pharaoh do? He mocks that. Look with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 in one hand, and Daniel chapter 4 in the other. Just a few pages over. Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 2, we have the account of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The dream of the statue with the head of gold all the way down to the feet with the clay mingled in with iron. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21, we have Daniel speaking. Let's go to verse 20. Let's start at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. It is here that we see an understanding that God can and will affect the hearts of the king. And not only that, but God sets up whom he will for the purpose of his glory. The king of Heshbon, Sihon, God knew before he was ever made king that the people of Israel would come to him in the day and ask if he, they could pass through peacefully and Sihon would harden his heart and then come out to meet the people of Israel for battle. God knew that. Because he removeth kings and he setteth up kings. I, I really like the first part of that in verse 21. He changeth the times and the seasons. Do you know what happens to us as a society, as an educated society oftentimes? Now I'm not against education. I can't be against something I don't have. Amen. I'm not against education. But what I can tell you is we've tried to scientifically explain everything that God and his word says he's in control of. Amen. Who's in control of the weather? God. I know you're waiting on me to give you the answer. <laughs> you know the answer to that. God. Who's in control of the seasons? Who's in control of the climate? And what does the Bible say he can do with all of them? change them he can change any of it now we can do all listen i don't know if anybody in here's you know climate change environment any of that stuff I, I don't know i don't care it's not my business all right i'm pretty sure there's a lot of stuff i do every day that affects the atmosphere but ultimately who's in control of all of it now does that mean we shouldn't steward what god has given us in creation no it's not a free pass to just junk everything up. Matter of fact, the fact that we understand that it's all God's and it all belongs to Him ought to make us take better care of our stuff. Amen. But nevertheless, when it comes to certain things, we have removed ourselves because of education and because of, as the Bible calls it, science falsely so called. That's in the Bible, warns us of science falsely so called. And we've removed God from the equation because we think we can explain things in a better way. 
how about we just trust God with all of it? Now, is it wrong to be interested in those things? No. As soon as those things start to supersede your knowledge of God, all of a sudden we've made what? An idol. You see, anything can be an idol. It's important that we understand something. We would do better to teach our children that God is in control and you fear Him and serve Him. Take care of your stuff because it's good stewardship to God, not good stewardship to mankind. Amen? God changeth the times and the seasons. But He removeth the kings and setteth up kings. This is why I can't get mad at election time. Because whoever gets into office, who's the one that put them there? Even when I don't like them. Whoever it is, any side, God put them there. Look at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 is the account of Nebuchadnezzar. We see Daniel chapter 4, we've, we've, we've looked at prior where he deals with Nebuchadnezzar being told that he's going to essentially be removed from the affairs of man and be made to like a beast. Look at verse 17. This matter is the decree of the watchers. Who are the watchers? They're a heavenly host of beings. They're described in scripture. They're described as watchers. Different from angels, different from seraphims, different from cherubims. They're called watchers. And the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men And giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. You ever wonder why such low creatures can 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 win elections? Amen. (laughs) What does it say? He can set up over the basest of men, the low of the low. Who puts them there? God. God's in control. Now back to Deuteronomy chapter two. God knew that the king would harden his heart. Verse 30. The Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as it appeareth this day. What was the purpose of God hardening the king of Heshbon's heart? So that he could deliver those people to Israel And show Israel that he is in control. And to begin the fear of the nations. Now that leads us to point number four. And the final point tonight. The Lord our God delivered. Look at verse 31. And the Lord said unto me. Behold I have begun to give Sihon and his land before thee. Begin to possess it that thou mayest inherit the land. Verse 32. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to fight in Jahaz. If you want to go back and study the account, that's Numbers chapter 21, verse 33. Now we see, and the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. The Lord our God delivered. Jump ahead to verse 36. From Erori, uh, which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even unto Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. Only into the land of the children of Ammon thou camest not, nor into any place of the river Jabbok, nor into the cities and the mountains, nor into whatsoever, The Lord our God forbade us. Twice we see the phrase, the Lord our God delivered, in this last portion of the text. I want us to understand that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God used Moses to pin to the people of Israel to remind them of the victory that the whole world thought they shouldn't have. Because they were a weak people. The men of war had been Wasted. The people before had been consumed. They've gone about wandering in the wilderness as a result of their own disbelief. God's not with those people. The psalmist David would recognize and focus on this throughout his days. Look if you will at 2 Samuel 22. Two times in our life that we ultimately are encouraged... That we see through scripture as well as examples. 
when we should focus on it as God that gives the victory. God that gives the deliverance. If you're taking notes under point number four, the Lord our God delivered. In victory, we should remember. In victory, we should remember. 2 Samuel 22, verse 1, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song, and the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies, and out of the hand of Saul, verse 2, And he said, The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. Second Samuel 22 would be the text that underlines and focuses on us, bringing us the cornerstone of Psalm 18, which, which sounds almost exactly like the first three verses of 2 Samuel 22. Psalm 18, verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. In victory, it's important that, that we remember it's not because of anything that we have done. But it is God that gives the victory. You see, any time we, we do well, or any time things seem to go well, or maybe the decision that we make seems to yield good fruit, what do we like to do? Boy, I'm pretty smart. Man, I'm glad I figured that one out. Do you know what we should do instead? God, thank you for that. God, it is you who gives the victory. One of the things that we, and especially I believe men, struggle with, although I don't pretend to know what women struggle with, but I can tell you, I can see it sometimes. Sometimes when things turn out right, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, we struggle with wanting to take the credit. And we get mad when other people don't recognize us. Oh, I did, I did all that work. They didn't put my name in the bulletin. Preacher didn't shake my hand. Right? Now, we've never had anything like that happen in nine years here. All right? Never. I want, to re I want to reiterate. Never. But I don't know what your heart thoughts are. So it could have happened, and I just don't know it because I'm naive to those things. And I say praise God for naivety. Amen. We have to recognize that those victories that occur, who is the giver of victory? It's God. If you've got a struggle with sin, and you pray and you cry out to God, and he gives you the victory, the first thing you ought to do, God, thank you. You're struggling with a dark place, you're struggling with something, or maybe you just feel the attacks surrounding you. I told many, I've told anyone that's ever gone through discipleship, the first thing I tell you, whether it's in our, our cost of discipleship or whether it's one-on-one -on -one with you privately, I will tell you, the second you try to start being a disciple of Christ or going through something to, in order to grow you spiritually, and by the way, we all need to grow. Amen, amen, and ain't nobody arrived. We all need to grow. But the moment you try, what happens? It's like you put on a vest with a target for the enemy. You better serve God. Because all of a sudden, things start happening. They're just, just things are just random, it seems like. But it's not random. And then we go through that and we're still standing because God has given us the victory. The first thing that we should do, God, thank you. Thank you for this victory. We would do well to remember the victory comes from God. We would remember to do well that the Lord our God delivered in the midst of victory. But the second time we would do well to remember is in troubles. In troubles, remember the Lord our God delivers. Psalm chapter 40 Psalm chapter 40, the psalmist David said in verse 17, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. It would appear this psalm was written during a time of trouble for King David, and yet we find him trusting in God even in the midst of trouble. 
If you notice from the prior verses, the key to his trust is found in Psalm chapter 40 and verse 11. Let's look at two passages and we'll, we'll be done. Psalm 40, Psalm 40 and verse 11. Psalm 40 and verse 11. David cries out, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve thee. Jump to verse 17. I've already read it, but I want us to look at it together. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. Poor and needy. That's how King David saw himself. This was the man... This was the man that has already at this point in his life slain the Philistine giant. This is a man at this point in his life has already protected sheep from great predators. This is the man at this point in his life that has already been anointed by God to be the next king of Israel. And yet he's in a time of trouble because his enemies are surrounding him. He's in a time of perplexity because of all of the pressures that are mounting upon him. And yet in the midst of that, he asks God not to withhold his tender mercies. He recognizes that he's poor and needy. But then he understands that God has not forgotten him. Isaiah chapter 40, verse chapter 26 and verse 3. Isaiah, Psalm 40 and Isaiah 26, verse 3, just ties together. Let's look at Isaiah 26. I wish we had time to go over the prophetic value of this to see the teaching there. Isaiah 26, and verse 3. So go, go to verse 1. Let's, let's, let's build the context. You search the scriptures. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord. How long? Forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down. Even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. We go on and see the judgment of God being sure. We see the people of Israel being pointed to what the psalmist David understood. That when you trust in God in troubles. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Only when God is the focal point of all of our thoughts can we truly be at peace. In the time of trouble. Remember the Lord our God delivers. In our text in Deuteronomy, we see the wisdom of the author pointing the hearer back to the one that gives the victory. Why is this important all the way back here? Because the people have already faced a great battle that they were never supposed to win. They weren't that strong yet. They had never seen war. The people who fought had never been a part of a war yet. Not on this scale, at least. And yet, we find... That God is preparing them to enter into the land. Moses is about to give them direction. On how they are to live when they enter into that land. But before they ever do. They have to remember. The Lord our God delivers. Let's all stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer.